useful arts, to quote the Constitution. Now, woven within this dynamic are questions relying on the proper scope and exercise of the property right. And this is exactly what a patent is. A patent is a property right. What types of behavior can a patent owner engage in when exploiting its patent? And at the heart of these issues resides notions of competition, certainty in one's property rights, industrial economic policy, and most importantly, what types of rules in the patent space enhance economic welfare? As early as 1858, the Supreme Court captured the balance between private property rights and welfare of society this way. The court wrote, whilst the remuneration of genius and useful ingenuity is a duty incumbent upon the public, the rights and welfare of the community must be fairly dealt with and effectually guarded. That's mid-19th century. That broad balance between private property and access to that property is what is at the heart of patent law. And that's from 30,000 feet. And, and I think that language in capturing the balance, I think that helps us to at least begin to understand why the Supreme Court has been and historically has engaged patent law. Now, monitoring and adjusting this incentive dynamic, this balance, has infused the court's engagement for 150 years. It was a motivating force in the 19th century and remains a driver today. Now, to add some context and structure to the court's approach to this incentive dynamic, we can temporally organize the court's three principal periods of engagement. Looking out over history, I think there are three periods we can examine and say, this is when the court has been engaged in patent law, and we could learn from some lessons from these periods. From the mid-19th century throughout the post-bellum era up until 1891 would be the first period. So really sort of the second half of the 19th century. In 1891, we have the Everts Act and the creation of the Intermediate Courts of Appeals. Uh, the second period would be the 1940s. And the third period, what sort of prompts this talk, is from about 2002 to the present. While simultaneously protecting inventor rights and society's welfare has always been present, at the granular level, there are divergent reasons for engagement during these three periods. The 19th century, for instance, can be characterized as a desire to maintain uniformity, as well as the court exercising a national leadership role in patent law. Whereas the 1940s intervention was driven by a particular view of industrial economic policy in the wake of the Great Depression. And, and the most recent period, interestingly, is based on the court reasserting itself as a national leader in patent law, much like it did in the 19th century. But this time, this time, its role is informed by a certain skepticism, or to put it more bluntly, to gauge the correctness of the Federal Circuit's decision relating to hardcore patent issues. Now, of course, the United States Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit is the uh, circuit court in Washington, D.C. that has subject matter jurisdiction over all patent appeals, regardless of where the trial was held, regardless of where it comes from at the federal district court level. And so I think the Supreme Court is paying more attention to substantive patent law issues this time around. As we will see, the court is uncomfortable, the Supreme Court, that is, when the Federal Circuit significantly disrupts the incentive dynamic or adopts a rigid, rule-driven approach. Okay. Let's begin by looking at the first period in the 19th century. The court was very active, as I said, from 1850 to 1891, in part because it had no choice. The court did not control its docket during this period, and in this regard, it served the same function as the Federal Circuit does today namely promoting uniformity. Every appeal went to the Supreme Court straight from the court of first instance. But while a significant number of patent cases were heard uh, by the court, many of them were trivial, never would have been granted cert if the court had that power in the 19th century. Nonetheless, the court took its role as national leader very seriously. The evidence reflects that the promotion of uniformity and the exercise of leadership were drivers behind the court's approach two noteworthy rationales when engaging a field that is steeped in property rights. The court's seriousness in patent law is evident in the decade from 1850 to 1859, which is easily the most qualitatively significant with respect to patent jurisprudence. 
some of the great classic cases that are relied upon today and inform patent law today were decided during this time. The court was firmly immersed during this time in patent law's incentive dynamic, trying to strike the right balance among inventor rights, improvement activity, leaving enough room for competitors to improve upon a technology, and also guarding the public domain. This is the decade that produced Geller v. Wilder, an opinion by Chief Justice Taney, who is known more so for his Dred Scott case than he is for patent law, but he was a very important player in patent law. Um, in Gell v. Wilder, we were told that novelty is, be de is to be determined on publicly available, available prior information or prior art. Another case is Hotchkiss v. Greenwood. And in patent law circles, these are, this is sort of, these are the giant cases um, that, that we talk about in, in school and are cited in briefs to this day. In, in Hotchkiss v. Greenwood, Justice Nelson recognized a patentability requirement beyond novelty. Not only do you have to be new, doesn't, not only does your invention have to be new to get a patent, but Hotchkiss v. Greenwood said it has to be something more. Today we call that non-obviousness. Another case is Winans v. Denmead, Justice Curtis. In Winans v. Denmead, the court recognized non-literal infringement, meaning that for infringement to obtain, an accused product does not have to practice everything that you're claiming in your invention. It could just be substantially the same, and there could still be infringement. And then O'Reilly v. Morse, another tawny opinion which set the limits on eligibility and enablement. And there are several others as well during, during this time. In each of these cases, the court tries to strike the right balance, right? This is the common denominator in the court's engagement. For instance, let's take Gell v. Wilder for a moment. In this case, there's a gentleman named Fitzgerald who invented a safe, called it the salamander. He thought he was the first to invent it. And in litigation, one Mr. Connor comes to the stand, and Connor began to testify. He says, no, I, I invented this some time ago. And the attorney under cross-examination said, well, tell us about this invention, Mr. Connor, somewhat condescending tone. And Connor says, well, I, I can't remember it in great detail. I just know. I just know what Fitzgerald did, I did. And that was all Connor could develop, this, this sort of vague recollection. And the court said that is not enough to defeat patent rights. Right? You, don't, you need more than that to come up in terms of your memory to defeat patent rights. And the court said this. It is the inventor here, meaning Fitzgerald, that brings the invention to the public. It, it is he who places it in their possession. And as he does this by the effort of his own genius, the law regards him as the first and true inventor and protects his patent, although the improvement had, in fact, been invented before. So the court assumed that Connor may have come up with this, but without more, right, the court was not going to defeat Fitzgerald's rights. Connor may have abandoned the safe's use, the court wrote, and been ignorant of the extent of its value. Yet, if it was the same with Fitzgerald, the latter would not, upon such grounds, be entitled to a patent, provided Connor's safe and its mode of construction were still in the memory of Connor. Now, this is an interesting quote. What is the, what is the court saying here? At first, the court is praising Fitzgerald for bringing this invention to the public. Fitzgerald, you're the type of inventor patent law wants to reward. And the only reason, though, it becomes clear that Fitzgerald gets his patent is because Connor had a faulty memory. The court said, Tawny said, if only Connor could remember more. Oh, yes, I constructed it this way. I added that. It's all coming back to me now. You know, I've abandoned it years ago. I no longer practice it, but oh, I remember now. The court says if Connor had testimony like that, perhaps more eloquent than that, then Fitzgerald's rights would have been invalidated. So here, Fitzgerald is praised, but at the same time, we see a statement that is very protective of the public domain. Once in the public domain, here, Connor's the public in his mind, right? Once the public domain, in the public domain, always in the public domain. Connor had a better memory, Fitzgerald would be in trouble. The balance. Consistent with its aggressive approach, to policing the public dom the domain, Connor, the court gave us, excuse me, the court gave us Hotchkiss v. Greenwood. Again, here, 
the court demanded more than just novelty before a patent right was issued. This was a case that dealt with a doorknob. Right? You know, today we talk about DNA. 18th century was a doorknob. And so this was a doorknob where the inventor simply changed the material, the construction, not, the, not necessarily the structure, just the material on the doorknob. The court said, it's novel, there's nothing like that, but the difference is formal and destitute of ingenuity or invention. There was an absence of that degree of skill and ingenuity which constitute essential <laughs> elements of every invention. In other words, the court said, the improvement is the work of the skillful mechanic, not that of the inventor. Again, guarding the public domain. Before we grant a patent, you're going to have to give us something special, right? something that is significantly removed from what came prior. O'Reilly v. Morse, this was a tawny opinion, was reluctant to give Samuel Morse, famous for the Morse code, his infamous claim eight. Of course, we remember Sam Morse. What people don't know about him, by the way, he was a uh, famous painter in his day and uh, taught fine arts at New York University before inventing the Morse code. I tell my students that. They're sort of struck by that um, because we remember him for uh, the machinery and the code itself. And so he came up with this extraordinary invention. A lot of people were working in telegraphy at the time, but it's Morse who actually made it practical. Right? And this was such a transformative invention, right, because it divorced uh, communication from transportation. No longer do you have to get on your horse or hey, go to on, on, on the railroad car and to deliver a message. You could stay in one place. So it had huge implications. And Morse knew this, right? Morse knew that he captured something that had huge commercial value. So when writing his patent, or his attorney writing his patent, he set forth the specifics of his invention the machinery, and the code itself. That was uncontroversial. But then he wrote this in the patent. And, and, and today, this is, this is extraordinary language, but here it is. He said, I do not propose to limit myself to the specific machinery described in the rest of my patent. Right? What I actually invented is in that patent, but I don't want to limit myself to that. The essence of my invention being the use of the motive power of the electric or galvanic current which I call electromagnetism, however developed for making or printing intelligible characters, letters of signs, and a new application of that power of which I claim to be the first inventor. He knew that he was creating some broad shoulders with this invention, and there are going to be a lot of people standing on these shoulders because of the huge commercial potential there. And Morse wanted to capture that activity, that improvement activity, what we call follow-on improvement. Chief Justice Taney was having none of it. He was very much concerned, Taney was, with leaving enough room for others to stand on Morris's shoulder and improve upon it. Here's what Taney said. For aught that we now know, wait, we don't use language like that anymore, right? For aught that we now know some future inventor in the onward march of science may discover a mode of writing or printing at a distance by means of the electric or galvanic current without using any part of the process or combination set forth in Morris's patent. But this person would have to come to Morris for permission if we give him this claim eight. Right? And that was too broad a piece of territory that the court was willing to give. In other words, commensurability. We will only give you private property right in what you actually invent. Okay? So there's a fairness there, a balance. One year after Morris, the court decided Winans v. Denmead, a case considered to be the precursor to what in patent law we call the doctrine of equivalence. The court asked if the alleged infringer adopted the principle of the patented invention. Not the literal language, just the principle. So this is more of a pro-patent opinion. The court wrote, to permit a defendant to escape infringement by asserting that the patentee only recited one form of his invention in his specification, would render the property of inventors valueless. So what we see already is the court, again, entering patent law to try to create enough incentives, like Winans v. Denmead, for patentees to invent, yet leaving enough room for others to build upon it. That was what defined the 19th century, and indeed, my thesis is that defines all forms of engagement of the Supreme Court in patent law, particularly today. 
Deeper in the post-bellum era, the court became increasingly more skeptical of patents because of monopolistic concerns, the birth of the corporation. More invention was being created in-house, and corporations were wielding that private property in powerful ways. And so by the turn of the 19th century, the court turned more of a skeptical eye to patents, but still so firmly within patent law's delicate balance, that incentive dynamic. So the first period of engagement is one that witnessed the court trying to strike the right balance. In the second period, the court puts its collective thumb on the scale in favor of alleged infringers, resulting in a congressional response. Let us turn to this second period now. For the first 15 to 20 years, of the 20th century, the Supreme Court, given its greater discretion in the types of cases it entertained, was relatively quiescent in the field of patents. In the 1920s and 30s, the court did grant cert on several patent cases, but relatively few of significance. This changed in the 1940s, when the court averaged 4.5 cases per term. Of course, this was in the wake of the Great Depression, which informed the views of patents of several of the justices, particularly Justices Douglas and Black. Under their leadership, the court approached patents with a great deal of suspicion, emphasizing the monopolistic and social cost aspects of patents. The court expanded the patent misuse doctrine in Mercoid v. Midcontinent, did away with the common practice of drafting claims in functional terms, in Halliburton v. Walker, and most significantly, enhanced the so-called requirement for invention by invoking the flash of genius test. In other words, in Kuno Engineering v. Automatic Devices, the court says, you know what, it's just not enough to sort of labor in the lab and come up with something. You have to have a flash of genius. Right? Later on, the court required a display of synergism. The sum of its parts must be greater than what you would expect. This was the Atlantic v. Great Atlantic v. Supermarket Equipment case. So you have the synergism requirement, you have the splash of genius test. All these hurdles were thrown in the path of inventors before they could get a patent. Indeed, this patent skepticism prompted Justice Jackson to write in a dissenting opinion, and I quote, the only patent that is valid is one which this court has not been able to get its hands on. And that was a view by many, and this was a 1950 dissenting opinion. It was in this judicial climate that Congress intervened in 1952 and overruled some of the court's handiwork of the 1940s. The flash of genius test was gone. Synergism, gone. The Great Atlantic case that I mentioned in particular, according to Giles Rich, who was a principal drafter of the 52 Act and became one of the most influential jurists in 20th century patent law later on. He was appointed to the bench by uh, President Eisenhower. Rich wrote, this case is what persuaded the drafters of the 52 Act to replace the case law with a statutory provision. Here we have the court just going a bit too far in the balance dynamic, right? It's not only where private actors engage in what they do, invent, innovate, improve upon, and then a lower court engage, uh, sort of disrupting that balance, and here comes the Supreme Court sort of altering it, so readjusting it in an optimal way. Here we have the Supreme Court in the 1940s, it was thought, of tipping the balance too far. And then Congress had to intervene. Years later, as a judge, Giles Rich wrote about this invention requirement, this requirement where you need something more than just novelty. He said, this invention requirement left every judge practically scot-free to decide this often controlling factor according to his personal philosophy of what invention should be patented, whether or not he had any competence or knowledge of the patent system. This requirement in the 1940s, justices or judges could say, okay, there's novelty here, but is there invention here? Well, what does that mean? And, and Judge Rich said, well, it could mean anything you want it to mean. And Congress needed to intervene at that point and add some definition. So 19, the 1952 Act was sort of a vote of no confidence in the Supreme Court's patent jurisprudence of the 1940s. 
that period of engagement was corrected by Congress. It should come as no surprise then, in light of sort of Congress's unambiguous criticism of this precedent, precedent in legislative reform as a response, the court heard just four cases during the 1950s. In fact, from 1950 to 1982, the court averaged about one case per term, and a majority of the patent cases it did hear focused on things like venue, procedure, preemption, antitrust, not substantive patent law issues. Our third period, our final period of engagement. In 1982, there was a huge event in patent law circles. The Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit was created. It, the reform began with under President Carter, it was signed into law by President Reagan. It created a specialized court, or I should say a centralized court. That is, every patent appeal, as I mentioned before, no matter where the district court physically resides, goes to the Federal Circuit. Okay? Now, the creation of this court meant that the proper role of the Supreme Court vis-a-vis -vis patent law became more complicated. The Federal Circuit has national jurisdiction. No longer can the Supreme Court rely on inter-circuit splits to tee up an issue, much like it does in other areas of the law, copyright and trademark, for instance. And the Federal Circuit, while having a diverse docket, is regarded as an expert judicial body in patent law, a body that has the comparative luxury to apply sustained attention to technological details. So we should not be surprised to learn that from 1983 to 1994, for 12 terms, the High Court was quite reticent to engage patent law, hearing just five cases during these 12 terms. From 1995 to 2001, the court heard eight patent cases. But much like the 1970s, many of these cases were not core patent law issues. Again, we saw jurisdiction being addressed by the court. We also witnessed a case of the Administrative Procedures Act in Dickinson v. Zirko. And then there were constitutional-centric cases, such as the application of the 11th Amendment in Florida prepaid and 7th Amendment jury right concerns in the Markman case and even a case called Warner Jenkinson. These are sort of right to a jury cases. And, and although, and, and Warner Jenkinson is interesting, it's a mid 1990s case, it, 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 it at least talked about a substantive patent law issue, this doctrine of equivalence I, I mentioned. But the opinion was restrained. And instead of elaborating in greater detail on this substantive issue, the court says we're going to defer substantive elaboration to the quote, spec special expertise and sound judgment of the Federal Circuit. So there still was this, this deference to the Federal Circuit. So from 1952 to 2002, 50 years, the court largely stayed away from engaging the delicate incentive dynamic of patent law, stayed away from core patent law issues. While issues relating to jurisdiction, sovereign immunity, right to a jury trial are important, they revealed during this time a court keen on policing the boundaries of patent law, not one inclined to take a deep substantive dive into hardcore doctrine and policy. This all changed in 2002. This was the year of the Festo case. Now, in patent circles, this is a very famous and important case. And it dealt with a decidedly substantive patent law issue, something called prosecution history estoppel. And this is real inside baseball stuff. In, in Festo, and I'm trying to unpack this a bit, the court found a vehicle to re-engage patent law's incentive dynamic in a substantive way. The doctrine of prosecution history estoppel, it acts as a leash on doctrine of equivalence. So it works something like this. When I apply for a patent, I could claim the world. Right, I could claim as broadly as I want, but we know I could only get what I invented. So I have my claims. The patent examiner will come back and say, you know what, you're claiming too broadly because here's, a, here's another patent over here that you're reading on. You're sort of overlapping with that. And so what's very common in patent practice is that I will narrow my patent claims to get a patent. I'll say, okay, patent examiner, let me, let me claim less territory and and, and now I think I'm ready to get a patent. And, and the examiner may say yes. So let's say, okay, yes, you get your patent now because you're, you're narrow, right? You're narrow, narrower. What prosecution history estoppel does is says, when I 
later assert that patent in litigation, I cannot recapture what I surrendered to get a patent. In other words, I'm a stopped. Okay. I cannot narrow my patent to obtain patent rights and then try to broaden my patent in litigation to prove infringement. Prosecution history estoppel says I can't do that. Now that is really deep patent law stuff. I, I spend three class periods on prosecution history estoppel. Why would the Federal Circuit engage this? Well, we'll talk about that, but one reason is this. The Federal Circuit held that, this is in Festo, at the Federal Circuit level, held that when an inventor narrows those claims, as I mentioned, right, that inventor is completely barred from arguing the doctrine of equivalence. It, prior to Festo, it was, it, and the doctrine of equivalence operated this way. I would, I would sue you, and you may not be making what I, what I think I um, invented, literally. You may not be making, I invent A, B, and C. You may not be making A, B, and C, but let's say you're making A, B, and D. I'm thinking, you know what? That's essentially the same thing. I'm coming after you. I can't prove literal infringement, because D is different than C, but D is substantially the same as C. That's the doctrine of equivalence, right? What prosecution history estoppel says, if I gave up D to get a patent, I can't recapture that. But at least I would have an opportunity to try to show equivalence. That was, that was built into the community. Everybody in the patent space understood that equivalence was a tool in my arsenal. What the Federal Circuit did said, if you narrow your claims, you cannot even assert equivalence. Okay? That came as a bit <coughs> of a shock. It became known as a complete bar, and indeed the complete bar came as a complete surprise. So again, why would the Supreme Court intervene in this context when prosecution history estoppel and the doctrine of equivalence seem to be within the special expertise and sound judgment of the Federal Circuit? Again, inside baseball doctrines. And to answer this question, I would suggest that the appellate court, the Federal Circuit's decision, disrupted patent law's balance, the balance we've been talking about this morning. It disrupted it in a way that was unacceptable to the Supreme Court. The court wrote, patent rights like any property right, its boundaries should be clear. This clarity is part of the delicate balance the law attempts to maintain between inventors who rely on the promise of the law to bring the invention forth and the public which should be encouraged to pursue innovations beyond what is patented. And the court, in a very candid, refreshingly candid way, said, again, this is, this is something where they really went down deep into patent law, and says, you know what? We understand why the Federal Circuit did away with the doctrine of equivalence in Festo, uh, in, in the context of a narrowing amendment, but there's a reason we have the doctrine of equivalence, and that's because language is imperfect, it's imprecise. Right? You, it's very difficult to describe things with words. The court said the conversion of machine to words allows for unintended idea gaps that cannot be satisfactorily filled. And this language is reminiscent of the Winans v. Denmead case of 1853. There the court said if patents were always interpreted by their literal terms, their value would be greatly diminished unimportant and insubstantial substitutes for certain elements could defeat the patent and its value to inventors could be destroyed by simple acts of copying. The court was very much concerned, again, with maintaining that balance. The criticisms of the doctrine of equivalence are well known, said the court. We understand that, right? And we have tolerated them for some time. And each time the court wrote, the court has considered the doctrine of equivalence, it has acknowledged this uncertainty. We have, it has acknowledged that it increases litigation costs, it adds ambiguity. But every time since Winans v. Denmead, we've affirmed the principle. And here, I think, is the most telling language for our purposes with respect to the Festo case. The Supreme Court said, the Court of Appeals ignored the guidance of our precedent which instructed that courts must be cautious before adopting changes that disrupt the settled expectations of the inventing community. 
you have a community of inventors in any given industry. And when a court creates a doctrine or modifies a doctrine that unsettles those settled expectations, then we may intervene. And I, we think this is what, catches, what caught the attention of the Supreme Court. Four years later, in a case called Lab Court v. Metabolite, in a dissenting opinion on a dismissal of the case, Justice Breyer wrote, a decision from this generalist court, meaning the Supreme Court, could contribute to the important ongoing debate as to whether the patent system as currently administered or enforced, implicit by the Federal Circuit, adequately reflects the careful balance that our federal patent laws embody. So now we see the court from 2002 forward re-engaging the patent system in a substantive way, very much concerned about this balance between the inventor and society. That language is a long way from the deferential tone of the Warner Jenkinson case of the mid-1990s. Take a deeper dive into the court's motivations one sees during this third period of engagement, the Supreme Court's aversion to bright line rules and common law rigidity, both of which tend to be too disruptive of patent law's ecosystem of incentives and protection. And so in 2002, we have the beginning of the third period of engagement. After 20 years of the Federal Circuit experiment, the court began reasserting its historical role of leadership in the area of patent law, and it continues to the present day. From 2002 to the most recent term, the court has heard 17 patent cases, three this most recent term. This may not sound like a lot, but one of the lessons we've learned from the 19th century is that the court can exercise its leadership role with one or two well-selected cases. How has the court selected this term? Has it selected well? Let's take a look at these three cases. You may be familiar with these. There's a case called Monsanto v. Bowman. Monsanto asserted two patents against a farmer. His last name is Bowman. And Monsanto has sort of a, an uneasy relationship with, with farmers, um, but they have a very innovative bioagra uh, inventions, and patents. Bowman replanted Monsanto's Roundup Ready seed, and, and therein lies the dispute. So let me see if I could unpack this a bit. There's a company called Pioneer Hybrid, which is a Monsanto licensee. Pioneer Hybrid sold patented seed to Bowman, a farmer. And the sale was subject to a contract called a technology agreement. Under this agreement, farmers could only use the seed in a single season of planting. Farmers were permitted to sell the second generation because the seed self-replicates. Right? They were farmers were permitted to sell the second generation seed to local grain elevators for commodity use like feed, but they could not replant the second generation. You'd have to come back to Monsanto to buy another seed. The elevators sell these commodity seeds, but they do not distinguish between those seeds that contain the Roundup Ready strain and those that do not. The, the, the power of Monsanto is evident. They have, a, they have a seed that's bioengineered to be resistant to Roundup, the, the herbicide. So you could spray away and you'll kill the weeds, but not the crop. And so that's the power of the seed. So in, in, in the elevator, right, in the grain elevator, you would have seeds that were resistant, Roundup Ready seeds, and seeds that, that were not. But because of Mar Monsanto's market dominance, the overwhelming majority of commodity seed are progeny of the Roundup Ready seeds, and thus carry the resistant trait. So here's what Bowman did. So he purchased seed from Monsanto, first planting, not controversial. Then, instead of going back to Monsanto, he purchased and used commodity seeds for his second planting, because it's a lot less expensive than going back to Monsanto. He planted them, he saved the harvested seed, it replicated itself, and found indeed it was resistant. No surprise there, right? Because chances are, in that, in that silo, you're going to have a Monsanto seed. So Bowman used that self-replicated seed to plant the following year, in violation of the technology agreement, and Monsanto sued. The Federal Circuit held that the doctrine of patent exhaustion, which says, if I sell you a patented device, you could do with it what you want, except you can't make another copy. 
but you could resell it, you could use it as many times as you want. That's patent exhaustion. The Federal Circuit said patent exhaustion did not apply here because the new seeds grown from the original batch were never sold, right? The, the original batch replicated itself and created a new seed. The grower here, Bowman, created a newly infringing article when commodity seed was planted. The court said the right to use patented technology upon purchase does not include the right to construct an essentially new article on the template of the original. Supreme Court granted cert here. Okay. The question presented to the Supreme Court was, did the Federal Circuit err by refusing to find patent exhaustion after an authorized sale of the patented seeds and by creating an exception to the patent exhaustion doctrine? Who wins this case? I, I don't know. But I will take a guess just for sake of this talk. It looks like Monsanto has the arguments here. Right. To find that Monsanto's patent rights were exhausted upon the first sale of the original seed, an exhaustion applied to the original seed's progeny would make it exceedingly difficult for Monsanto pr to protect its innovation and investment in seed technology. Monsanto would most likely increase the price of its seed and its Roundup herbicide or require farmers to show proof of provenance of the seed they are planting all of which lead to significant inefficiencies. Moreover, the biotechnology industry, whether it's bioagra or biomedical, rely heavily on the patent system. In other words, there are settled expectations. Right? And we know about settled expectations uh, and, and how important they are to the Supreme Court. Two more cases. There's a case, uh, the Federal Trade Commission sued uh, Watson Pharmaceutical. This case relates to what are called reverse settlements. Here's the question presented, and I'll tell you the facts. It says whether, the question presented is whether reverse payment agreements are per se lawful unless the underlying patent litigation was a sham or they're presumptively anti-competitive. It works something like this. I'm a pharmaceutical company. I have a patented new drug on the market. There's federal legislation called the Hatch-Waxman Act that allows a generic company to want to market a generic version before my patent expires. And what the generic company could do is assert that my patent is invalid. Okay? And there's a whole mechanism that's triggered by that. And the idea behind the act is to get the generic to society sooner than later. If the patent is invalid, or at least as soon as the patent expires. What's been happening lately is that, and this happened in Watson, is that the pharmaceutical company and the generic company enter into a settlement agreement. Now remember, the generic company is the alleged infringer here, but this is a reverse settlement. So the pharmaceutical company pays the generic company to stay off the market, typically until the patent expires, maybe a bit before. Now, if that agreement extended beyond the patent term, then there's clearly antitrust issues. But the term of the agreement lasts at least up until, or no longer than when the patent expires. Is this anti-competitive? Supreme Court took the issue. This is a difficult one, right? Um, it looks like something's going on here that has antitrust implications for sure. The problem for the government, for the agency, however, is that you have a patent. This is just not good old-fashioned collusion. And the patent is presumed valid, right? What that means is that the FTC has to, to, for their theory to work, at least their primary theory, there has to be an assumption that the patent will pr have to be shown to be invalidated, that the chances of it being invalidated are quite high. And some patents are invalidated for sure. But we don't know. Right? We don't know that. Right? And so the settlement sort of takes that risk away if you're the parties. The pharmaceutical company pays the generic company to stay off the market, that settlement does not necessarily lead to an inference that the pharmaceutical company thinks this patent is invalid. It may simply be that they want to get on with business, they don't want to pay attorneys, let's settle this matter. So this may be a difficult one for the FTC to win, simply because the presumption of validity. You have to take that into consideration. The last case is perhaps the most well-known. This is the Myriad case, and the question there, are human genes patentable? 
are they eligible for patent protection? Right, this has captured a lot of attention. And the Federal Circuit held, yes, that they are patentable. And what the Federal Circuit said is that they're eligible, and they're citing Supreme Court precedent because there are three filters where the Supreme Court said, if a subject matter falls, in with one, it falls into one of these filters, you cannot be eligible for protection. Number one, if it's a product of nature, if it's a naturally occurring phenomenon, you can't patent it. Mathematical algorithms, abstract ideas, those are off limits. Why isn't a gene a product of nature? The, the Federal Circuit said because when Myriad isolated a gene, this is the BRCA1 and 2 genes, this is for, um, these genes have predictive value for breast cancer and ovarian cancer. If, uh, once it's isolated, the only portion that's isolated is the coding portion, the gene itself. Genes in their naturally occurring environment are surrounded by non-coding portions. They may have a regulatory function, but have nothing to do with the gene. So Myriad isolates the gene, takes it out of the body, and that is structurally different than native DNA. There's enough human intervention to give it markedly different and distinctive characteristics. Judge Bryson wrote a dissent at the Federal Circuit where he says, no, look, what you're patenting here, the code is the code. What you want is the code of the gene, what you codes for a specific protein. That is the same. It's like snapping a leaf from a tree, wrote Bryson, and trying to patent that leaf. Yeah, it's structurally different. It's no longer part of the tree, but it's still a leaf, just like the code is still the code. Faced with this strong legal argument of Bryson, the majority in Federal Circuit invoked policy and said, look, no one's going to patent a leaf. Patent law is about promoting innovation in this particular space. It's a great example, biotechnology. And if there's anything we know, biotechnology industry, pharmaceutical industry rely on a patent system quite a bit. And again, there's a concurring opinion which brought up the language settled expectations. I will equivocate here on my prediction. Because if you go with a strict legal argument, it looks like Judge Bryson has some persuasive value in his dissent, and the court may latch on to that. If you work through the lens of settled expectations, and you understand that the court historically has been more of a stabilizing force, focusing on incremental change, not a change agent, perhaps Myriad wins this one. But this is a tough one. Let me conclude by noting then that these three cases reflect, as in the 19th century, the Supreme Court assuming a role of national leader in patent law once again. Intervening where patent law's delicate incentives have been disrupted, and you see that potentially in each of these cases. While the principle of national uniformity has largely been addressed by the creation of the Federal Circuit, the High Court still sees itself, indeed, as reasserting itself as the judicial leader one with ultimate responsibility to monitor and maintain the proper balance among the inventor, the competitor, and society. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, this was exactly Chief Justice Taney's concern, is that, you know, in the 19th century, it was hard to envision the use of, you know, where this technology would take us. Morse knew there was going to be something extraordinary, and we know there has been and will be something extraordinary. The concern is exactly that, that if every improver, no matter how innovative, would be captured by Morse's Claim 8 and would have to go to Morse. Now, one could argue and economists have argued this, that, well, there's efficiencies for giving Morse that power. He's the flashlight in a dark room. You know who to go to. But what if Morse says, you know what, eh, I don't think I'm going to give you a license. You know what, I don't like the way you look. We're presuming rational action here. Empirical evidence has shown that the more eyes we have focusing on improvements, the quicker the pace of innovation. But it's a balance. We don't want to have so many eyes where we take away the incentive to make another giant leap. And so it's that balance.
But I think what you highlight is exactly what Tawny was concerned with. There was a dissent in this case, by the way, by Justice Greer. On the issue that November 8th? Yeah, yeah, and I'm, I'm happy to go into that off offline if you want, but there, there are arguments for giving it to him. The, 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 those are two really good comments. Let, let me take them in turn. I, my, my sense is that you're right about, particularly Justice Breyer, that there's a sense that you know, the Federal Circuit does have a monopoly on patent jurisprudence. And for 20 years, the High Court was willing to give it deference, as reflected in some of the cases I, I mentioned. I do think that after 20 years, the Supreme Court says, you know what, we need to start taking a closer look, even if it's hardcore patent issues. And I think in part it's because the Federal Circuit, sometimes if you're the only player you don't, and you don't have the benefit of sister circuit jurisprudence, you could, you could become a little path dependent, a little stale. There's no one really looking over your shoulder, right? And ever since the Supreme Court has started paying more attention, you notice the Federal Circuit being a bit more careful in this jurisprudence. It's a great court. It's smart people. But the opinions are more, are more articulated, more detailed, more careful. So I do think that the Supreme Court thinks the Federal Circuit has no peers. We're really the only check. Congress intervened last year, but it took six years for them to get anything on the books. And what they did wasn't really very substantive. It was more procedural. So I think that's absolutely right. Your second point, I agree with, too, that there is this notion that corporate assets 80% are intangibles, and it's a driver in the economy. The 1940s had a view, the court had a view of industrial policy, this court has a view of industrial policy, and there is this sense that to, you have to engage patent law's balance. You know, we, the court recognizes the need for incentives, but when the federal circuit has disrupted that, and maybe they disrupted it too far in the Myriad Genetics case, um, the court needs to intervene. Breyer, in particular, is very keen on these eligibility questions. You know, should we even allow certain types of things into the patent system, right? And, and, and what he would say, and this is with the metabolite case I quoted, that case was granted cert and dismissed, and he dissented from the dismissal, and he said, you know, we need a generalist court to weigh in here. He very much is concerned about scope, that if you let in abstract ideas, software that may look like software, but it's really an abstract idea. Here's a gene. That's going to take up too much territory. That's huge scope, and maybe patent law needs to sort of put the brakes on. I do think that's a motivating factor as well. Thank you for that. He has more of a copyright issue. I know, I know the networks are absolutely furious with this, right, because of the fee structure. I, I don't know enough about the specifics. It's more of a copyright uh, issue than it would be a patent issue. Um, so I don't know enough about to speak intelligently on it. I, I will tell you that it's a, it's, it's a very disruptive structural, right? Structure is very dis disruptive, um, and it, it relates to sort of transmission and, and broadcast rights, and there's plenty of stuff in the copyright code, but it goes beyond copyright. That's really the extent that, that I, I could comment on, unfortunately. Oh, I just, I, I, is it, as a last question, is, yeah. the, uh, is the law under copyright less or, or more defined than, than patent? 
Yeah, that's really that's a really good question. If if you look at the copyright statute, it's much more technical and detailed than the than the patent statute. And the patent statute can be characterized as common law enabling. There's all sorts of delegations implicit to the judges to fill in the holes. In copyright, you have some of that, but not as much. So if you get to the cable provisions and all the exceptions, very detailed. And largely because you know, content providers, Hollywood, have a lot of power, and there's not really a countervailing force on the other side. Uh, and so I would say it's more detailed. I don't know if it's any more clear, but it's certainly more detailed. The statute is, is packed. Yes. On the uh, Monsanto case. Yes. How much? How much of that uh, overall decision is going to be based on the actual con contract that was made between the actual farmer and the uh, Monsanto? Yeah. Or if I was to agree with that point in my life, and I would have bought some grain silo. Yeah. Would I have been patented to the world? Right. That's 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 a that's a great question, and so I think this technology agreement, the effect of it on the case is an open question. And, and the, reason, the reason it is is because the, the, the seed replicates itself, right? If I sold you my can opener and I said to you, you could only use it on Tuesdays, okay? And you sign that contract and it's patented. In the absence of that contract, you could use it any day you want. But here I said only Tuesdays. And you use it on Wednesday, and I catch you. Is that patent infringement, or is it just breach of contract? That's, a, that's an open question right now in patent law. The Federal Circuit has held that's patent infringement. The Supreme Court a few years ago decided a case called Quanta, which didn't directly address that issue, but in a footnote indicated that that breach would be mere contract, contract damages. So here comes Bowman. And a lot of us want to see this issue resolved, of course. Because it's self-replicating, though, it's like a new article, right? It's because it's, 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 it was never part of the original cell, so exhaustion may not attach. And therefore, the contract may not have as much relevance. There is, there is something in a technology agreement that does prevent second planting, right? So if Bowman planted, purchased seed, planted, seed replicated itself, he brown bagged it himself and replanted that directly, that's clearly a violation of the contract. Okay. Now, the question would be, is that patent infringement or breach of contract? But Bowman went to the elevator and bought the commodity seed right, that maybe some other farmer sold, which was permitted under the technology agreement. As a farmer, you're allowed to sell for feed. So I don't know if that seed, though, is really subject to the technology agreement. Ultimately, you could say it is because the second planting of a Monsanto seed. But the but path is not as linear. If you went to the grain elevator and you planted a seed, right, that is, well, you're planting for the first time. You could do it, right? And I, I don't know if the elevator would be able to sell. I don't know if the relationship with Monsanto would permit that but you could do it. And then the question is, okay, it replicates, you get the seed and you replant. You could, you could do that absent the contract, it seems to me. I think Monsanto would probably, I think those contractual provisions are in place that would prevent anyone who's not part of that ecosystem from doing that, though. Yeah, that's a good question. That intersection between patent law and, and, and contract law is fascinating. That's it. Okay, well, thanks very much.